Welcome to the Palm Springs Linguist YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Andy, and I have two special guests today from a podcast, a brand new podcast about Epcot Center called the Epcotian Adventure. So um, let's start with you, Sue, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Sue, and uh, I've been a lifelong Disney fan. Um, we try to get to the parks as often as we can, and most of the time that's Epcot. So uh, we we focus our energy there. Excellent. And Rod, um, how do you and Sue know, know each other? <laughs> I've known Sue since the day she was born. So use my little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we actually share a place here in Missouri, and um, we share expenses, which is what allows us to do multiple trips to the Disney parks. Cool. Yeah. We don't live a lavish lifestyle. We just we spend the money on Disney instead. Yeah, yeah. And how do we know each other? <laughs> you and I go way back. <laughs> yeah. um, I started at Disneyland in. Uh, New Orleans bear country attractions. So yes, I'm an old fart. <laughs> Andy, I think you were, were you already there? That was 1987 actually for me. Yeah, I hired in in 1986. I was in outdoor vending from 1986 for about a year and a half. And then I transferred to Tomorrowland attractions. Okay. And then I was um, on the opening crew of Splash Mountain. And then that's where we met. I think that's and where you and I, I did get trained. Awesome. Yeah, and I did get trained on. Um, I actually knew more rides in New Orleans Bear Country than I did in my own uh, <laughs> land of Tomorrowland, which was cool with me because I liked it better. In fact, when I transferred from outdoor vending to Tomorrowland attractions, Tomorrowland was actually my second choice. New Orleans Bear Country was my first choice, and they didn't give it to me. So, that's um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it worked out well because of uh, Splash Mountain really saved me. Yeah, you were opening Crew Splash, right, with Ron? And I was. Team there and or um, goodness, yeah, I came in and got trained on Splash just before. So it was supposed to open in November of '89, and then it ended up in July of '90. And I got trained. I think it was in December of '89. Yeah. So I still technically was not on the opening crew. But I was kind of on the opening cruise. <laughs> yeah, you were very close. You very, yeah, very, I ended up being Flash GC as a lead when it first opened. So yeah, I was one of the GC leads when it first. Get, uh, sorry, guest control. And that was a really cool time because because it was an opening crew working there. It was people from all over the park. So that was really fun to be able to work with everybody there. So I I want to make sure from the get go though that we mentioned your podcast. So. Tell us about your podcast. What's it called? Where can we find it? And what's it about? Yeah, well, if, uh, it's, yeah it's, go for it. Too. <laughs> uh, it's called the Epcotian Adventure. Um, we came up with that name because we love Epcot and we um, decided if we like Epcot, we might as well be Epcotian and claim to be from Epcot. So, <laughs> and. Um, we named it Epcotian Adventure yes. before we had seen the pre-show for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, where they used the word Epcotian. Uh. <laughs> the rights to Epcotian. So there we go. Yeah. I thought that was kind of a bold choice because um, <laughs> of the name, because it's, yeah, that's probably what it would be called. It's, um, but it's, uh, you know, you had to kind of take a stab at something and uh, I, I really like it. I think it's. I think it's cool. Awesome. So that's good Sue, to hear from worked... linguist. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Sue, you worked at the park as well, right? So... I did. I was um, college program in '92, the summer of '92. I worked on the foods crew, also New Orleans uh, Critter Country. So I started at Brer Bar and Hungry Bear. Um, did that for the whole summer and then left, went and got my degree in theater and uh, came back and worked on Aladdin, a musical spectacular over at the High oh, really? Theater in um, DCA. Okay, so you both have that in common, right? Because Rod, didn't you leave and come back to DCA as well? 
<laughs> like most good Disney cast members, I left in eighty nine or sorry in ninety six and transferred uh -huh. to the Kingdom East attractions where I worked on Grand Prix and the arcade over in Tomorrowland at Walt Disney World. Um, one morning while watching the sunrise over Spas uh, Sp sorry, Space Mountain, Space Mountain, uh -huh. Space Mountain uh, from the Grand Prix while I was filling up the cars with gasoline. Uh, uh, I decided I'd had enough of Florida after six months and came back to California and ended up in merchandise on Main Street in 2000 okay. and did that from 2000 to 2001. And then when DCA opened, I actually worked in the stroller shop that morning on the morning of DCA's opening. Uh, cool. And then, yeah, in uh, 02, I then moved over to attractions at Paradise Pier and worked there until I became a training tool developer and wrote training tools for Disneyland Resort and Hong Kong Disneyland Resort, and then ended up as a payroll assistant and training, no, and uh, labor recording assistant. Okay. That was the last thing I did before moving to Missouri. Stayed in theme parks, but that, that was the end of Disney for me as a cast member. So when you mentioned being at uh, DCA on opening day, that you worked at DCA on opening day, uh, I went there as a guest on opening day, and I Sorry. remember being kind of shocked that practically nobody was there. Yeah, like, we, this is we special. Told, this is the opening of a brand new Disney theme park. Where are you people? We were told to get there at like 0500 to make sure that we could get in without all the traffic getting in the way of us getting to uh, the cast member lots that existed back then. They've all changed again. Um, yeah. And so I got there, sat at the in-between, which was the cast member commissary, so to speak, behind the Plaza Inn on Main Street uh, until about, I think, 7.30. And I went over oh, to yeah. work. I was scheduled in the shoulder shop at, at Land. So I ended up uh, there, and they were looking for people to go help with all of the big crowds that were going to be over at DCA. So yeah. I'm like, hey, new park, why not? Was there for uh, 30 minutes after opening, and the line was gone, and it was a ghost town. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. Um, okay, so prior to work, I, I hired into Disneyland in 1986, but I was a first generation annual pass holder. You know, in 1983 is when they started selling them, and I had them in 83, 84, 85. And, you know, some friends that I made there that I hadn't seen in a long time, I thought to myself, well, if they're ever going to be at Disneyland, they're going to be here today. And so I remember keeping, I was, you know, with some friends, but I remember keeping my eye out for them, thinking that, you know, if they're ever going to make the effort, it's going to be on that day. And again, I didn't run into anybody like that day that should have been like this epic Disney day. <laughs> uh, kind of uh, fizzled. Yeah, it was funny. Sue and I went to the cast premiere. Uh, Sue wasn't working there at the time, but I, for her birthday, they did a cast premiere in January. So I took her for her birthday. We stayed at the Grand Californian and uh, were there for the, it was about a month before it opened, I think. So most everything okay. was operating, but we went and I remember riding uh, the Superstar Limo. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I can see Sue's expression. So bad. It's so <laughs> bad. Yes, saw it. Oh, I just so could one of you give like an elevator speech of what Superstar Limo is, just in case there's any listeners that don't know what we're talking about? Go for it, Sue. It was a dark ride that put you um, in a slow moving limousine where you got to go through downtown Hollywood and see all the stars come out. So yeah, it was yeah. very, very poorly done. Um, 2D like flat yeah. images <laughs> of superstars like Whoopi Goldberg and Drew Carey <laughs> and Jackson. anyone who had a Disney contract, I guess. Yeah, literally, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, it was really, really bad. It was embarrassing bad. You know, I think it's one of those cases though that it was so bad it was good. <laughs> like, didn't you feel oh, like my. you had to go on it because it's such a train wreck? Yeah, exactly. Most people, I don't think even saw it because that first year the attendance was off i mean a lot of yeah. people went at the beginning but then that first year you know was not a great critical success for the company for the park yeah. and so they closed it a year later 
And <laughs> most people now just know it from legend or from videos. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah. Well, and then the Monster Zinc ride is so cute. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it definitely got a upgrade glow up, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's a much better attraction now. Well, well it's a much we, better park. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, when the park opened at the Hyperion was Blast, I believe was the uh, was the show. And then by the time oh, Sue got around to doing um, uh, assistant stage managing for Aladdin, Land. the park had started coming into its own. Now they just opened up. Uh, didn't they just open up a new show on that state that stage? I believe they did. Um, they finally got rid of Aladdin and it went to Broadway. They did a full show out of it. So yeah, um, they replaced yeah. it. I can't even remember what they replaced it with now. The last thing I saw there was uh, Frozen. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that that was definitely there for a while. And then I don't know what came after. I had heard they had a short-lived run of something going in there. Unfortunately, I mean, even though we grew up with Disneyland, our home park now is Epcot. Yeah. We spend, um, being right in the middle of the U.S., we can actually get to Disneyland or Walt Disney World in about the same amount of, uh, amount of time. It's about two and a half hour flight from wow. here. So it's nice so, being where we are to have the options, but unfortunately yeah. the flights are still cheaper to Florida. <laughs> yeah. But also when you go to Florida, you're so you're immersed in the Disney magic and the Disney bubble. When you go to LA, you're still in LA. So. It, you know, and I feel that, you know, I, I definitely have a connection to Disneyland in that it's the Disney theme park I grew up with, and it's the first one, and that's always going to be special. But honestly, I feel more like a kid when I'm in the Magic Kingdom in Florida because it reminds me of the Disneyland when I was a kid. You know, like oh, I can go on the People Mover. Yeah. You know, I there's all sorts of attractions like it it hasn't progressed in this at the same rate as disneyland has it's more of a time capsule <laughs> yeah agreed so, yeah you get the yeah. um you get the people mover like you said and uh carousel of progress is still there yeah the, the dinosaurs on the tr well no the no, <laughs> yeah, they don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> Your dino is Rex over at Hollywood Studios. Okay, there so. we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it really does. Dino call, call back that original Disneyland. Yeah, so, I, and working at both locations, working at both Magic Kingdoms, basically at Disneyland uh -huh. and Magic Kingdom. Every time I go to either park, I have that nostalgia factor uh, mm -hmm. as a cast member. But then also, Sue and I went to uh, Epcot opening year. We were actually there in September of 83. It wasn't even a year old and caught the opening of, or the soft opening of Horizons. Uh, we Horizons is my favorite attraction. Me too. And, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy, did that break my heart when they replaced that. And for, for no reason. It was a perfect ride. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and what they replaced it with, you know, of course, they replaced it with Mission Space. Right. And Mission Space, it does fit into the future world theme, so I'll give them that. At least it was, you know, on target as far as theme goes. But I always but, felt that um, not only was Horizons a great attraction, and it's almost kind of like a sequel to Carousel of Progress in a way, mm -hmm. it, um, it encapsulated what future world was all about. And, you know, when people say that, oh, it was dated, oh, please. You know, who's... How many people are living under the water? Right? How many people are living in outer space? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it really did, like you said, it totally encapsulated the whole idea of Epcot in one attraction because it even covered like transportation and it covered communication and it covered like all the other things within the one ride. It was perfect. And, and it had a great theme song oh. as many oh future world attractions did um the moment that i really really loved though in the music was that outer space theme um when yes. you, in the outer space scene there's like instrumental music in the background mm -hmm. and i find that so inspiring like that's what i want to run like if i'm running on a treadmill i want to listen to that <laughs> that's awesome yeah the original epcot music in general just absolutely nailed it the I, i'm not a huge fan of the tomorrow's child but most everything else, <laughs> I, I absolutely love that music. 
And Stu, that, that well, wasn't there when it first opened, right? Wasn't that a later add-on? It was when I think when Cronkite came on was yeah, when I, I they believe did right. it. Yeah, and I don't even remember the first guy's name, but <laughs> we looked it up the other day, and it was somebody, uh, Vic Perrin, actually, I believe is who it was. There you go. Oh, really? And uh, he was a big voice back in the seventies and eighties, and. I hate to say it, the first voice I remember as well is Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Yeah. I would swear to this day that he was there opening on the opening one. And no, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so both of you were there opening year at Epcot Center. And what were your first impressions of Epcot Center? Oh, my. Uh, I took a course at Epcot. Uh, through it wasn't even called Disney Institute at the time. I'm not sure what it was called, uh, but it was a learning course that I actually got some school extra credit for in high school. This is again, I'm, I'm an old part, and uh, it was based on energy. So before we had even as a family gone to Epcot, I went with a group of kids and an instructor, and in a white van drove around. Uh, through the parking lot and saw Spaceship Earth for the first time and just was dumbfounded. I, to this day, walking under Spaceship Earth, just off to the right, there's a point where these pieces of concrete come together, and I swear that's my center point for the universe. Um, it, it just, I, I knew I wanted to be a cast member from a very young age, mm -hmm. but that moment was when it solidified. It's like, this is what I'm going to do. And you know that yeah thought i wish i had but i didn't <laughs> yeah i was there this in 84 that was my first trip there uh you know speaking of spaceship earth and that you know being the centerpiece and all of that i am so impressed with the lighting they have done in the past couple of years with that oh that really gives me the feeling when i see there it's like oh yes this is this is what i fell in love with even though we didn't have that back then but it it's gives me that feeling of that uh you know when I was um, a newbie to Epcot Center, it, it's so natural to the to the Spaceship Earth and everything. Like it feels like it should have been there from the beginning. It's, it's such a yes. great addition. Absolutely. The new so, icon. Sue, what about you? What was some of your? Uh, oh, go ahead, Rod. No, I was just saying the new icon lighting is just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love so, it. So, Sue, how about you? What was some of your first impressions of Epcot Center? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a little younger than rod so i was yeah. just going into fourth grade at the time and um i remember the poster oh there's my kaylee girl um, <laughs> I her, name is kaylee? her name is kaylee Hi, named kaylee. after a character on the show firefly oh very good <laughs> um yeah uh i remember the poster at the time had spaceship earth on it and it said the future begins October 1st, 1982. And yeah. walking into the gates and seeing Spaceship Earth live and in person and bigger than I ever expected it to be. And I like I took that verbatim. Like I put took that as gospel. Like that this is what the future is. And yeah, I remember yeah. going to the um transportation and seeing at the end you could walk through and see the cars of the future and they had one that was called the arrow 2000 and i remember thinking in my fourth grade mind that's the car i'm going to own in the year 2000 when they come out with this car <laughs> uh -huh. like everything felt so futuristic but also attainable like it felt like this yeah. really yeah. is our future it was really it was such a fun experience to see it as a kid like that one of my impressions that i had my first impressions i look back and go and think to myself wow you were really wrong about this because yeah i love the scale of epcot center at the moment i was there i thought the park was amazing um but what disappointed me as, and i was you know i was probably I was born in 69, so I was, what, like a 14-year-old, something like that, 14 or 15-year-old, um, is I was disappointed in how many screens there were, you know, how oh. many, like, movies, and even when you go on some of the rides, there were movies, and I look back and think to myself that it's so funny that I thought that because there were more audio animatronics in Future World 
than in any other park in Disney history. Like I would, you know, the, sure there were a few screens here and there, but they just added to it, to the show. They didn't really detract from the show. And mm -hmm. uh, I just, I feel like I was way off base because it was well, amazing. When you go to a Universal park, I mean, I'm not bashing Universal. We were just there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when you look at their lineup of attractions at Universal Studios Orlando, that kind of mirror what's on the tram tour in Hollywood, Fast mm. and the Furious, King Kong, um, they're all video They're all screen things. rides. They're yeah. all screen rides. And every time they open something, Jimmy yeah. Fallon, the new one, it's, a, it's just a, that poorly executed simulator. It, I have really mixed feelings about Universal because by the end of the day, I feel like I've seen the same ride six, seven times. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Our, our latest uh, episode, which we're going to re be redoing if you watch this anytime soon. Yes, the sound quality is poor. We're working oh, okay. on it. <laughs> uh, <it's been> <laughs> so we're still playing with our sound, and this last one is yeah. pretty bad. But we're at, but that's something that is we touch on is that there's just so many of the same ride where if we, when yeah. you go to Epcot, there's so many varied ride systems when it first opened. Yeah. I mean, they had films that you saw, but you would go in and you did the hydrolator to get into sea base alpha yeah. at the uh, living seas, which was not their opening day, but right. They, they added to the show. They made waiting in line an event as well. That's something Disney mm -hmm. does very well. That Universal, up until the Harry Potter or Islands of Adventure areas uh, or park, yeah. really just had not nailed. They're getting much better at it. Islands of Adventure, created by a group of ex Disney Imagineers as Universal yeah. Creative, um, they got it right. But it's there interesting are... working for Universal now, and you walk out of Diagon Alley. Yeah. And you look across and you see Men in Black or you see the Transformers building or you, the theming yeah. is not cohesive. Right. And whereas Walt, when he created Disneyland, he always had the weenie that drew you in to the land, the castle, the, mm -hmm. sh the, the Mark Twain, the rocket jets, the carousel. I, I'm glad that Universal's coming around and I have a feeling Epic Universe, when it opens, will have that fixed. <laughs> yeah, Disney needs competition to keep them yeah. um, keep them honest and to keep them um, to be in a position where they need to maintain the high quality that they've had in the past. So it's it's definitely a good thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Epcot Center. So um, one, what's one thing from the past that you dearly miss? And what's one thing from the present that you think is better than it's ever been? Oh, that's a great question. Um, one thing I dearly miss uh, is Horizons. I feel like we kind of yeah. already talked about that, so I kind of feel like that's cheating. Yeah. But um, <laughs> definitely Horizons, I miss every time we go. Uh, I I hope that the ride is as good as it was in my memory, <laughs> but uh, it's just phenomenal. Um, yeah. One thing I think is better than it's ever been is uh, Spaceship Earth. I yeah. Think. Oh, I love both your answers. I completely <laughs> agree with both of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really it's think never looked that spectacular. That ride has been better and better and better. Yeah. For How about me, Rod? I, I think I miss. It's twofold. I really miss World of Motion. Yeah. I loved Gary Owen's voice on that uh -huh. attraction and the the. Uh, humor that that attraction had. And this is something we even brought up in one of the podcasts is that the fact that a dark ride could go outside and then back in the building was mm -hmm. mind blowing to me. <laughs> I don't yes. know why. Um, but I also miss the original, and this will be no shock to anybody, but the original journey into imagination. Again, not an yeah. opening day, but very close. And right. the original Figment uh, filled attraction with Dreamfinder. I can't believe to this day that they haven't brought Dreamfinder back in some yeah. way shape or form um I, it's way, hard for me to even go on the current ride because it just makes yeah. me angry <laughs> nobody wants to smell skunk to me yeah. <laughs> it's a carny trick it's something that six flags does in their yeah. attractions to go ooh, gross 
Yeah, the, the thing I think is the best it's ever been is uh, Living with yeah. the Land. I love the original Listen to the Land, uh -huh. but the the kids' choir music that was inherent in most of the uh -huh. attractions in Future World back in the opening, um, it felt too childish to me. I you love know, what they've done now. It's funny that you say that, and I know you mentioned that in one of your episodes of your of your podcast, at the, the Coast and Adventure, because I remember... Uh, uh, my ears perked up when you uh, made that comment about that song being kind of childish. After I left Disneyland, the first job I had after my 10 years of Disneyland was I was an elementary school teacher. <laughs> and once a year um, at the time, we had to take our class and do a performance in front of the rest of the school for an awards assembly. So what did I do? I had the kids learn listen to the land. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which is completely appropriate because like you said it's childish and these were little kids oh that's perfect oh my god yeah. it still was not the most annoying song though to this day the most annoying epcot song of all time and sue i think will back me up on this oh yeah real del tiempo we used to oh. call it el mundo pequeño because it was like <laughs> it's a small world but worse yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that, oh, that that, that original music was awful. Oh my gosh, yeah. it was so bad. <laughs> full attraction. I I don't know how that made it out of WDI out of Blue Sky because the part where yeah. they go through and they're trying to sell you things. I mean, yes, we've got enough cruise ships in Mexico and many ports, and that's fairly accurate. But it was, I felt it was demeaning to the culture. The I, entire attraction to me was just. I feel the same way. It's like, yeah, it's not that it's not accurate, but is this really the part of Mexico that you want to highlight? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> There's so yeah, many exactly. great things about Mexico to celebrate and to highlight. It's like you, you didn't have to spend time on that. Yeah. <laughs> and the new version of the attraction with Donald and the three three amigos, <laughs> what I call yeah. it, the three caballeros, <laughs> um, to me is, is a better version. It's more Disney. And I like I'm I'm a Disney purist when it comes to most things, but with Epcot, and this is not going to be a popular opinion. I love mm -hmm. that they're bringing in the uh, IP and the you know, intellectual property in because mm -hmm. it's what was needed to bring the younger generation in. Okay, I, I love that you brought up that subject. Yeah, because I I agree with you that I think that it it's a good thing, or at least it can be a good thing. And I think that in World Showcase, they did, they've done a very good job of that. Like, uh, I feel like uh, the Three Caballeros, you know, one of those birds is literally from Mexico and they're mm -hmm. traveling to Mexico. It makes sense. Ratatouille, it makes sense. It's very much a Parisian story. And in that whole land is really themed specifically to Paris. Like, it's good. In Future World, and I realize that it's no longer Future World, yeah. The one that really, really bugs me is the seas with Nemo and friends. Oh, interesting. And it's, not be it's not because the characters are there. I'm okay with the characters there. But the character, in my opinion, the um, Dory and, you know, all the different characters from um, Finding Nemo, it's great that they're there, but they need to teach us about the ocean, not tell us the story of Finding Nemo. Oh my point. gosh, you're so right. I had never thought of that. I so I'm thought you were headed to Norway. Oh, oh yeah. I was you to go to Norway. That's funny, but you're right. It's absolutely, and had Walt still been at the helm, that's what it would have been. They would have yeah. had a lesson yeah. for us in that. Yeah, that's Walt literally funny. invented edutainment within the theme parks. I mean, yeah. look at the original Tomorrowland, and the, the, he had the House of Aluminum, or I mean, the House of the Future. The, <laughs> what was uh, Monsanto? I forget. It was the uh, Museum of Aluminum or something. It was something just. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It, it. You look at it now, and it's like, how did that ever get into a Disney park? Of course, Main Street used to have a lingerie shop. So. Yeah. The wonderful and Wizard I feel of like Not only um, was it he the master of edutainment, he also um, taught me a lot about American uh, American history and American culture. Like I feel like American folk songs. I know because I went to Disneyland and I, you know, I sat through America Sings a million times. I loved that show. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I died the day that closed. Yeah. Um, Were you at the last show? 
I missed the last show. Um, I it was for some reason I don't remember why, but yeah, I was not able to be there. I was when there. I was and a, it, so sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no you I go. Was it, when I was um, doing my training for um, cash handling, when I went uh -huh. in for the college program, our cash handling class was in that building. And they yeah. still have that little stage thing set up. And it was just the best thing to get to go in there again and see. I mean, obviously, it wasn't the show. But right, yeah. <laughs> to go in there and reminisce. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, another. America's Things was a good example of it was a fantastic attraction, but it didn't necessarily fit into the land. Uh, Out of place. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, like. I think we have Carousel Progress fit there. Yeah, a, yeah, a little bit more. But when they switched out for America Sings, it didn't, it didn't belong anymore. I have the feeling they thought it was going to be temporary because, you know, they were gearing up for the um, bicentennial. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think we can all forgive it if it's just, you know, to celebrate the bicentennial and then it's out of there. But you know, it's too good of an attraction to just rip out after a couple of years. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. that would well, have been a fun one to update. And yeah. keep around, you know. It was so high capacity too that it really helped overall in the park. And that's something that seems like the parks have been missing. You look at DCA with the Mohold Madness, um, mm -hmm. with the movie Sky School. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. On yesterland.com, I found a picture of me operating Moholland Madness the other day. <laughs> so oh, how cool. You can see me when I had hair. And it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been I've been told yeah, that uh, my photo was on the, di um, and this was after I hired in. Um, somebody came up to me um, when I was working Space Mountain bottom of the ramp, and she she worked for the Disney University, I believe, and she said, "Okay, you know, let me take a picture of you." Okay, so she took a picture of me, and she said, "Okay, now can you slouch?" And so, you know, I slouched, you know, which of course you're never supposed to do, but she took a photo of me. So she had like a before and after photo. And I guess that became part of the training for a while. Um, you know, like this is what not to do. Don't do what Andy does. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's what you want to be known for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here's a topic for you. Yeah. Um, working Haunted Mansion, as I did for many, many, many years, there are ghost stories beyond belief from the mansion. And when I worked in a merch over at, oh, I'm going to, uh, it used to be the character shop, Star Trader. Yes. Um, I went up into the third floor to get a plush one night and had an encounter with something. Uh, working Space Mountain is one way real? One way real. I don't no, even think I know the story that you're way. referring to. I forgot what they call Mr. One Way. Mr. One Way, yeah. He gets I on know about this. Tell the me vehicles, about it. and then you see him next to you, and then he's not there when he gets back into the <laughs> into the, when the same vehicle comes back. He's not there. There's stories of when the, the whenever there's a single rider and there's an empty seat yeah. next to him that Mr. One Way comes in from, <laughs> the, from the wrong side and will ride with you and then vanish. Oh, I love that. Oh, I'm gonna have to. I, I've got. <laughs> Uh, some of them, uh, as uh, you know, one thing that's golden about working for Disney is that still so many of my closest friends root back to the days of working at Disneyland. And a lot of them worked on Space Mountain. So I'm going to have to ask them about their stories about that. I have I would that love to hear it. That slipped past me. Actually, I would love to talk to you about that. We're actually going to be doing a Halloween episode for Ghost Stories of the Magic Kingdoms. Uh, it's actually oh, cool. a book that me and my friend, uh, actually probably remember Colin Christie uh, from the old days on the West Side. Him and I yeah. are ho hopefully going to be starting a sister podcast here about Disneyland. Uh, oh, in the cool. near future and both on our podcast for sue and i and on that one if that gets off the ground uh we're going to be doing some ghost stories of the magic kingdom so if you do find any information out we have to get yeah, I'll pass along to you oh cool okay so tell me um uh let the listeners know what what can they expect by um subscri subscribing to your podcast uh at potion adventure what types of content obviously you're talking about epcot but tell us a little bit about what they they can expect yeah we uh we talk a lot about epcot obviously that is our our home 
park. But um, we also talk about uh, our most recent episode is about our recent trip to uh, Universal and experiencing Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Uh, we talk a lot about um, how to do a trip to Disney. Um, our particular thing is we like to go just for a weekend. We just mm. we just book a cheap flight and go out for a couple of days. So um, how to make that feasible? You don't have to do a whole week at Disney where everybody is exhausted and angry by the time it's over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of our, our niche is how to do those quick trips. And we're very much Disney adults at this, as you can tell we're yeah not elderly but we're up there in our <laughs> me too who's not 50 yet i am <laughs> in my 50 something as, as the yeah. andy i know yeah because i mean i was born just yeah we're the same. same time you were there yeah. uh as were most of the people that we still probably remember from disney uh it, yeah and you're right about it being a uh a lifelong club almost i know more people i keep in contact with more people from the old west side at disneyland than i do from high school or college yeah but for i'm sorry back to us we cover all things disney we really mm -hmm. do we, we're going to be doing some um episodes based on the disney wish which we did a trip over thanksgiving uh we're going to be interviewing some people we have a next imagineer friend that we're going to be interviewing here coming up soon andy hammer uh who also was worked with disney creative oh, i'm sorry universal creative and yeah. uh shelby whitson from uh Disney World Entertainment, and <laughs> he doesn't know it yet, but maybe Jonathan Cohen. Do you remember okay. him from uh, the West Side from years back? Uh, uh, that one, that name doesn't doesn't ring a bell, but uh, maybe if I maybe when I hear his voice on your podcast, I'll go, oh, that's him. You know what? And I I always say this. He was California Adventure. Um, I know he and I worked together at Bears. Uh, because okay. our mutual friend Lynn Kuhn and him were were roommates for a while. But he's in Walt Disney World Transportation. We're going to be doing a lot of, we're not interview-based as a podcast, but we yeah. are going to be doing a lot of topics surrounding all things Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to branch out to do other things. We're going to be taking a trip to Marceline, Missouri uh, in the near future. Uh, and we'll be doing some information from there, from the Disney Museum and from the Wishing Tree, which I hear burned down. But Oh, really? I think half of it is still there. It was just hit by lightning. Yeah. It was I would just love a, to go, go there. Idea. That would be really interesting. Marceline it, is, yeah. It, it, it was our first road trip when we moved to Missouri and um, would love to go back because it's that's been 15 years ago now. So come on out. We'll take you over. Yeah. Yeah, I would love that. <laughs> Have you guys ever it's, been to um, Efteling in the Netherlands? I think it's already we have um, right before COVID hit. I was pricing out a trip to go to F to, to Effling and to Toverland and to Wallaby Holland because they're all uh -huh. right there outside of Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, I still get um, every birthday. Effling sends me a an email saying, "Hey, you can get free <laughs> free admission or discounted admission." It is on my list to do. Uh, we've been to Disneyland Paris a couple times. We've been to Tokyo yeah. Disneyland. We had a trip planned to go to both uh, Shanghai and Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, and then the virus, who shall not be named, yeah, uh, happened, and we had to postpone that. And now, yeah. the way political tensions are, I think we're going to push that one off a few more years again. Yeah, but yeah, our, uh, we we do travel to Europe about every other year. Um, oh, really? Oh, we'll be doing cool. Scotland for the fiftieth birthday, actually, but. Might yeah. we might swing over to a couple of the uh UK uh parks, but it's gonna be a while yeah. probably to definitely someday. I yeah. just, have you been there? I have, I've been there a couple of times, and Ooh, I, I feel like one thing is that it predates Disneyland by three years, so it has just as long of a history, actually a little bit longer. And it um it kind of has the scope of Epcot in a way, in that it's really big and it's park like there's an attraction that it's kind of like pirates of the caribbean but it's more like a middle eastern theme pirates of batavia so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's you know as a disney fan it, it's it, it needs to be on your bucket list it doesn't yeah. matter if you do it now or many years from now because this is tried and true like it's going to be around forever knock on wood um but it's it's amazing yeah that one and um tivoli is also on our on our bucket list too. We want to yeah. hit Tivoli Gardens. 
we I were haven't in, done, done that yet. We were in Copenhagen actually just uh, on the way to Paris and didn't have a long enough layover to get to Tivoli. Oh, yeah. But I know Walt and Lillian went to that park and some of the uh, some of the food choices, some of the architectural choices that Walt uh, brought into Disneyland uh, are because of Tivoli Gardens. It's oh, cool. Well, I'm going to have to put that on my list. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah there's another one there, too, called Bakken that's uh, really old, too. And they're within, if you have a chance, you can do both within a couple of days right there in Copenhagen area. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Well, this has been really fun. And Sue, it's really nice to meet you. And Rod, it's so great to talk to you after all these years. I love your podcast. Um, so just remind the viewers one last time where they can find your podcast uh, before we sign off. Well, we appreciate everything uh, you've helped us with on the podcast as well. I've uh, enjoyed talking to you today. And, and, and thank you for the advice you gave us uh, ahead of this even about how you do your your vlog oh, my pleasure i call them vlogs still just to make <laughs> yeah <laughs> and other vlogs um and we'd love to have you on our podcast uh that'd be fun absolutely but yeah you well, can as find you can me. tell i love talking about epcot or oh, yeah. any other theme park <laughs> <laughs> well even just some old disneyland stories disneyland is not absolutely. out of the realm for us as well so we do have a trip planned out to see some friends uh sometime in the next year uh hi brian and stephanie and phyllis uh, from <laughs> California adventure uh but uh you can find us on youtube you can find us on apple podcasts so you probably know more of these than i do you listen to more podcasts than i do yeah uh, we're on apple Podcasts, spotify um iheart radio um audible all the anywhere you typically listen to your podcasts we're there and Amazon Music. That's the other one. And Amazon yeah. Music. And make sure to, uh, you know, when you listen to their podcast, make sure to write a review. You know, yes, I've got another friend that has a podcast, a rock and roll podcast called Rock and Roll Confessional. And like what he's told me is that the big thing is to write a review for podcasts. Um, so I, I need to make sure that I do that for you guys as well. Oh, yeah, we so really thank appreciate you. it. Yes, those make such a big difference. Well, if so, you like our um, podcast, we are the Epcotion Adventure. If you didn't, we are the um, Disneyland Diary. And my name <laughs> is Jim. So, did you work the Jungle Cruise? Because that I worked like a the Jungle, Jungle Cruise, Cruise for nine years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, once a skipper, always a skipper. <laughs> I still spell boat B O T E. So yeah. There's and everything we just for, mentioned. Yeah. Um, what was that? And everything we just mentioned, I'll put it in the description below. So okay, just yeah. check out the links down below so that you can find them there as well. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And uh, best wishes on your podcast. And I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us.